Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Richard, and I'm here from Google. And I'm going to talk to you about building progressive web apps for everyone. On August 12th of this year, myself and a cross-functional team launched Chrome OS.dev, our one-stop home for all things Chrome OS. We launched in two languages, English and Spanish, with a site that was fully accessible, responsive, fast, and could be used offline. It took almost a year of planning and development and content creation, but in the end, we launched a progressive web app that can be used by everyone. To get there though, we had to change how we thought about design and development and how we did both. We didn't start out with a list of specific things we needed to do to make our site work for everyone, but we wound up finding that we were what we were doing fell into three categories. First was it needed to be fast. Having a site that starts fast and stays fast and has a small payload means it can be accessed by more people more often. It can have accessibility implications too, reducing cognitive load required to stay on task. Performance is key to having users be successful with your site. It needed to be usable. Users interact with their site in lots of combinations of lots of different variables, making sure it works just as well with only a keyboard and a phone as it does with a touchscreen and a desktop and everything in between is critical to providing a usable experience for everyone. And it needs to be understandable. In the end, users come to your site for its content. So if they can't understand it, they're not going to use it. Architecting your site and its content so you can create, display, and deliver content to your users, meeting them where they are, is key to having your experience understandable. To accomplish these three things, we needed to embrace automation, leverage new tools and techniques, and build new personal and team habits. A site built for everyone needs to first load for everyone. Our thinking on site performance comes back to the Nielsen Norman Group's seminal research on website response times and short-term memory and web usability. In it, NNG talks about why speed matters. Humans have very real cognitive limitations and humans want to feel in control. From these, they discuss five response time limits for humans. Anything below 100 milliseconds feels instantaneous and like we're in control. Up to 1,000 milliseconds or one second, users can sense a delay, but they still kind of feel in control. Between one second and 10 seconds, a user feels like they're at the mercy of their computer. Beyond 10 seconds, users start to think about other things, making it harder for their brains to get back on track and that they're no longer in control. And finally, above 20 seconds, whatever chunks of information a human has in their short-term memory start to recycle. Uh, and we start to become unable to remember what we were doing. With these in mind, uh, Google developed this rail performance model to take some of these human limitations and build a user-centric performance model to, for us to think about performance. There are four aspects of rail uh, and their user-centered goals are response, how long it takes to visually acknowledge a user's input. The goal is to do so within 100 milliseconds to feel instantaneous. Animation, as humans, we're exceptionally good at tracking motion. We dislike it when animations aren't smooth. Animations include not just moving elements, but scrolling as well. The goal is to produce each frame in 10 milliseconds or less. Short of that, aiming for visual smoothness as users notice when frame rates vary. Idle, tied closely to response, recommends chunking work done while users aren't in interacting with your page to 50 millisecond chunks to give you the best chance of being able to respond in time. And load, how long it takes to deliver content and become interactive so users can use your site. The goal is to do so in under five seconds for your user's average device power and connection speed, or not knowing that, mobile power devices and average mobile device speeds. We took a three-pronged approach to ensuring our site started fast and stayed fast. We automated best practices around image optimization, so contributors didn't need to think about them. We leveraged new tools and methods to build and deliver just the JavaScript we needed quickly. And we created a rail-based performance budget with Lighthouse to check our work. Automating best practices. 
When it comes to best practices, we relied on a single guiding principle, make doing the right thing the easy thing. As much as we could, we wanted to ensure that we met our content creators and developers where they were with what they already knew and automated best practices around that. We started with image handling, as it's one of the largest impacts to overall site performance and weight. While a one megabyte image will have a vastly smaller impact on performance than a one megabyte JavaScript file, making sure the right image is served at the right time is still an important aspect of performance. Because images may be rendered from a number of places, in our case, from Markdown, from metadata, and templating in HTML, we didn't want to burden, the burden to be on the author to remember to do everything right every time. Instead, we built a post-processing step into our work to make doing the right thing the easy thing and as easy as simply formatting an image tag properly. For SVGs, we optimized them and then lazy loaded them in. For pings and JPEGs, we wound up cutting multiple image sizes based on a scaling factor. We optimized each size and produced corresponding WebP images for all of them ultimately replacing the image tag that our authors had written with a full picture element, including all the sizes and formats, and of course, layers loading that in as well. For GIFs, we went a step further. Animated GIFs have a much larger file size than their corresponding video to do, due to how videos are encoded, and they can't be streamed like videos can. Because of this, we actually transform each GIF into an MP4 video and set it up as a silent looping autoplay video. If you happen to be using 11D like we did to build your site, we open sourced our solution for this uh, to a node module called 11D Plugin Local Responsive Image. JavaScript, though, has byte for byte the largest impact on all four aspects of the rail performance model, so we needed to send as little of it down the pipe as possible. To accomplish this, we created what we wound up calling a hub and spoke JavaScript model. Hub and spoke is a distribution paradigm borrowed from the world of transportation, especially airlines. It's characterized by a central node where all other nodes either traverse through or originate from. For us, that meant instead of sending one large JavaScript bundle down to our users, we send one small JavaScript file down instead that acts as a sort of coordinator for the rest of our JavaScript. Our hub file determines what features are required for a given page. Then, using ES module dynamic imports, sends out off asynchronous requests for those files, all of which export classes to be used, but don't run code themselves. Once they're loaded, the hub file executes the loaded classes as needed, which in turn may dynamically load other ES modules. For production, we take it a step further and tree shake our source, removing unused exports and compiling into multiple small bundles with commonly interconnected files being bundled together. In our case, we used Rollup. While this model does have a single point of failure, it can effectively scale to lots of modules and won't bring our user experience down if one of them fails to load. It also means we get interactive faster because ES modules are deferred by default, meaning that they don't block the HTML parser. The initial JavaScript load is also kept very, very small. In our case, less than two and a half kilobytes total. We also know we're only ever load code that's absolutely required for the page the user is viewing. And even better, we can differentially load additional code, not only based on if a feature is required, but the importance of the feature, even deferring non-critical resources until idle availability. When combined with our service worker, where we preload the individual JavaScript bundles without affecting our site loading, we're able to use the hub and spoke model to quickly get a user interactive with our site by only loading what we need when we need it and pulling it all in quickly from cache without additional network requests. Then finally, for fast performance budgets, we created a performance budget for our site and used our continuous integration system to test every change to our code base as it comes in. To do this, we use Lighthouse. Lighthouse is a tool that can be used to run a number of audits for your site and comes with built-in audits for performance, accessibility, best practices, SEO, and progressive web apps. 
You can run it through Chrome DevTools, through Node, or as part of your continuous integration pipeline. For all built-in audits except PWAs, you're given a score from 0 to 100 based on weighted results for each run and each audit. Lighthouse's built-in performance scoring is based on weighted measurements of key performance indicators, which for us aligned well with what we were looking to uh, looking for from the rail model. We allowed as low as 90 and ran our site against an average mobile device speed and power. Because there is some variance in testing, we ran each test three times and we ran it against a couple representative pages across our site. If changes to our code base would fail our audit, uh, we would get a report as to what went wrong. Everything was great then during what we thought was a routine upgrade to Lighthouse 6, all of our tests started failing. Lighthouse 6, 6 changed how performance audits were weighted and measured. Uh, a new set of holistic measurements for user experience called Web Vitals were introduced. A subset of them, the core Web Vitals, reflect real-world experience of a critical user-centric outcome. While they will evolve over time, the current set focuses on three aspects of user experience, loading, interactivity, and visual stability. And they include the following three metrics. LCP, or largest contentful paint, measures loading performance, specifically the render time of the largest image or text block visible within the viewport. Previous performance metrics like first contentful paint, first meaningful paint, and speed index are still good things to track but they either don't necessarily reflect useful content for users or are complex and hard to explain. Ideally, you want this under two and a half seconds and anything above seconds is poor. The next one is first input delay. It measures interactivity, the time from when a user first interacts with a page to the time when the browser is able to begin processing event handlers. Less than 100 milliseconds is good and anything above 300 milliseconds is poor. And then finally, there's cumulative layout shift, or CLS. This measures visual stability. Uh, and it measures the total layout shift for a page across its lifespan. Layout shift occurs anytime a visible element changes its position from one rendered frame to the next. It's calculated by multiplying the percentage of the viewport effective called the impact fraction and the largest distance any moved element has moved relative to the viewport called the distance fraction. A CLS below 0 0.1 is good and above 0 0.25 is poor. So what happened to our performance score? There was an automatic optimization that we had done inlining CSS for elements in our viewport into our HTML and lazy loading the rest, AKA critical async CSS that was causing problems. We had originally done it to boost our first contentful paint score, and it did that really well. Unfortunately, it also wound up having the net effect of causing a large cumulative layout shift for our pages. After some experimenting, we found that removing this optimization wound up removing the CLS problems we found at the expense of blocking our site, rendering a little bit longer, reducing first contentful paint. Fortunately though, it wasn't enough to have a real impact on largest contentful paint. And as a bonus, it made all of our pages lighter weight by stripping out almost 14 kilobytes of CSS for each page. By leveraging automation and continuous integration, we were able to create and stick to a performance budget. And when our performance budget got smarter, we were able to leverage both again to fix our problems and validate our work. With our site fast, we also needed to ensure it was usable. For us, usable meant that all content and all features of our site be accessed by all users, regardless of the combination of device, input, and accessible technology being used. To accomplish this, we needed to change how we thought about the relationship between design and engineering. There were two new habits we built in order to make our site usable for everyone. The first was creating staging testing sites. Reaching new people required new habits around development and testing to ensure success. Second one was designing in browser. While design started in static tools like Sketch or Photoshop, we found we needed the full expressive medium of the web to design great experiences for everyone. 
Much like performance, it's much harder to build a site or feature and then, once everything is done, go back and make sure it's all usable. In order to save us a lot of hard work at the end of our project, we made a commitment to start usable and stay usable. But we needed to introduce a new habit, backed by a little automation, uh, to make this happen. Staging testing. Our continuous integration system was already set up for running automated tests, but now we found ourselves needing to run manual tests too. So we expanded our CI system to build a staging environment for each change request and report it back as a comment to our code reviewers to use as a test ground. We use the staging environment not only to test the changes in general, but also specifically to test different input types like keyboard only usage. And we taught our teams the basics of assistive technology like Chrome, Vox, and VoiceOver. So we could test not only if the site was visually correct, but if it was tactilely and audibly correct too. Even with this testing though, some aspects of usability are more art than a science. A month before our launch, our Chrome OS accessibility team reached out to ask if they could test our site. For most projects, this would be the source of some dread. What are they gonna turn up? Will we need to delay launch? How much more work are we going to need to do? But for us, we were excited to work with them. We had been vigilant in our new usability habits and we were confident things would be okay. Talking through what we had been doing with the team, they were impressed. We had all of our bases covered and most things they'd normally look for, we had already done. Even so, they went back and tested our site. The results were mostly what we expected. No major issues, a couple of small tweaks here and there, all things we could fix in basically one change request, except for the main menu that you see on screen now. Now, it's not that our main menu wasn't accessible. Rather, they thought we could produce a better over overall experience with some changes. Our menu has a combination of links to other sections and buttons that open up drop-down menus for more links. Our original design entirely hid the drop-down menus visually and to assistive technology until a user activated the parent menu, at which time it became visible. Assistive technology users often navigate a site using built-in shortcuts to scroll through a site's links. And our solution didn't allow our main nav links to show up in this list if they were underneath a parent element. We wound up prototyping a solution that visually hid the drop-down menu, made them unreachable by toggling their tab index, but still allowed them to show up in an assistive technologies link list. We were excited about the potential for this solution. We hadn't seen a menu built this way before. After some testing and discussion though, we all decided this presented a new problem. Low vision users who use assistive technology may find there's a mismatch between what they see on screen and the spoken feedback uh, and that there are links available and they may find it confusing, make it feel broken. So it's not that our original solution was better or right, it's that after testing, after bringing in experts, after prototyping additional designs, we found that the trade-offs we had made in our original design happened to be trade-offs that we agreed were good to move forward. But a different team could have come up with different trade-offs and a different solution because accessibility is sometimes more of an art than a science. The second new habit we built was around how design and engineering work together and was buoyed by some new tech used in new ways, designing in browser. Designing a browser gets a bad rap. It's often thought of as requiring designers to learn development and write production code while simultaneously limiting creative freedom by constraining designs what can be done or really what can be done by these designers on the web. We instead took designing a browser to be an opportunity to design and develop, uh, design and development to more closely collaborate, almost like pair programming building on each other's strengths and sharing ideas and constraints to create a better, more usable result than would be possible with either on their own. Our process went something like this. Our designer would start designing two views of each page, a small view and a large view. We would consider these as starting points for our work, not the final designs. We'd break these pages down into components, individual blocks that contain content, 
and layouts, how those blocks are arranged on the page. For both, we try and figure out if we already had one that we could reuse or if we need to create something new. Then we'd go and build them. But when we did, we intentionally built them separate from each other. We would leverage Flexbox's ability to swap from inline to block based on element size to make components that could respond to how large they were. We used, sparingly, resize observers to change how, compu uh, how components functioned or even acted based on known CSS changes, letting us move components around without needing to write multiple media queries or share them with JavaScript. And we use CSS grid and content-based units like the CH or character unit uh, to build layouts that flex not only to the viewport, but to the content in them. Finally, design and development would sync back up, leveraging the live preview builds we had to work together to tweak the components and layouts between the small and large sizes, sometimes tweaking the small and large sizes as well, and bouncing ideas off each other as we went until we came up with a solution we all liked. And that turned out to be super important for us. In the two months since we launched our site, there have been 2,874 unique screen resolutions with the top 10 screen resolutions accounting for just barely 50% of total users. There are only four screen resolutions of those 2,874 that have more than 5% usage of all of our users. And with, screens, uh, with screen sizes with more than five users, our screen resolutions ranged from 300 by 426 all the way up to 5,120 by 1440. Coupled with interesting findings, like 1920 by 1080 screen resolution coming back is coming from mobile, tablet, and desktop devices. We really understood the importance of being truly flexible and not making functionality assumptions based on screen size is imperative to building something truly usable. After we finished this project, when we were going through our work, we realized that having done this, uh, we couldn't really think about building sites in another way again. It kind of showed us, it was like looking into the matrix of websites and seeing where everything kind of falls around the cracks. Fast and usable, we finally needed to ensure our site was understandable. This required us to make it available across multiple languages. This required us to internationalize our site. Just like when making our site fast, to make it understandable, we built some automation and leveraged some technology in a new way. First was structured content. In a single language site, the content is the content. In a multi-language site, content is really about its structure. And then with content in multiple languages, you need to be able to serve the right language to the right user. Service workers to the rescue here. Because we were localizing our site into multiple languages, our thinking shifted from content as a series of pages to content as part of a larger structure and how that structure fits together. When working with content management systems, it's pretty natural to structure content with fields and enforce what kind of content can go into those fields. Content that's, that's used and structured similarly are often given a name to identify them. These are content types. What happens if you aren't using a content management system? Our site is built with a static site generator, so we need to come up with a structure on our own. With content mostly written in Markdown, we're able to store additional fields in front matter, like you see here. But there is no built-in way to enforce a given structure for that front matter. When we first started out, our models were somewhat loose, our front matter all over the place, but then we stumbled upon an idea. What if we linted our content models? Using JSON schema, and the AJV remark and remark lint node modules, we built content models for all of our content stored in Markdown down to literally what tags were allowed in our tag section. Then we hooked up this linting to our CI system and we turned otherwise freeform Markdown and front matter into structured content that we could then work with across our code base. Combined with strong microcopy, the words and phrases used throughout our user interface 
uh, storing that in similarly structured files, we were able to build a new habit, moving away from hard-coded strings and designing and building one page at a time towards creating systems of content design and code. Structuring our content meant that we could then leverage some work we'd already done to make our site fast and usable to make all three better. Combined with our component approach, we were able to standardize input and output arguments, making all components across our site more flexible to what they accepted. Combined with our hub and spoke JavaScript model, we could load only the individual translation files we needed for only the components we needed when doing client-side rendering, like messaging to our users. And combined with our content-aware responsive design using those new CH units, we could have our UI flex for different languages without needing to create language-specific breakpoints. Being able to think about our content as a system instead of pages made our entire site more flexible, making it easier for us to localize and therefore make it understandable for more users. But we still needed to serve them the right content. There are lots of solutions for serving the right localized content to the user, but for us, we chose to take a relatively new technology, service workers, and leverage it in a new way. There are three high-level ways of determining what localization to serve users. You can get their location from their IP address. You can use the accept language header or navigator.languages to get a user's set preferred language. Or you can have an identifier in the URL. Often, systems wind up combining one, two, or all three when deciding what localizations to serve. After we investigated, though, we found enough issues with the first two to rule them out for us. A user's preferred language often doesn't correlate with their physical location, which is what IP address provides. Actually figuring out location from IP address is difficult, generally unreliable, and in fact, may prevent sites from being called by search engines. And then preferred language is often never explicitly set and more often than not defaults to English, making accept, header, accept language headers uh, unreliable. Because of this, we wound up using identifiers in our URLs. There are three common patterns for building identifiers into URLs. First is providing different TLDs for different instances, for example, example.com and example.de. The second is serving localized content based on a URL parameter, for instance, lang equals en or lang equals fr. And the final is localized subdirectories slash en or slash es. We decided against different domains as they're not a good fit for progressive web apps. Every domain, including TLDs and subdomains, are considered different origins and would effectively require a separate PWA for each localization. We also removed URL parameters as an option because it's difficult for a user to recognize, may be easily deleted, and can run into a number of analytics and management issues. So we went with subdirectories. Our site is serverless, so we needed a solution that uh, could support that. Because service workers are effectively in-browser proxy servers, and when combined with our subdirectory identifier, we can do localization redirects consistently, easily, and without a backend server. This is literally all the code to do it. It works like this. When a request comes in, we peel off the local the locale subdirectory and check it against a user's stated language and or region preference. If the user doesn't have a preference, we let them continue on, assuming they got the link from somewhere that had pre-filtered it for us, like from social media or from a coworker, and set that as their preference when they arrive on the page. If they have a preference and it matches, we again let them continue on. If they have a preference and it doesn't match, then from the service worker, before we make a network request, we do a 302 redirect to the same page, but in their preferred language. For anything that's not a content page, we simply let the request go through as normal. A relatively small bit of service worker code, combined with the right localization strategy, makes our site quick to figure out what localization you need to make our site understandable. If you want to use this code, we again have open sourced it. It's a node module, service worker I18N redirect, and it works really well with Workbox. 
So how did we build a progressive web app for everyone? We made it fast. We automated image best practices for optimization and delivery, created a hub and spoke JavaScript module for leveraging ES modules, and automatically and automated checking performance budgets to keep us on track. We made it usable. With the help of automation, we built new habits around usability and assistive technology, testing on staging previews and changing our habits around design, co-designing in browser, and leveraging new tools like Grid, Flexbox, and content-based units. And we made it understandable. We changed our habits around hard coding content and created systems of content we could automatically lint, as well as leveraging new uses for our service workers to automatically redirect users to their preferred localization. Fast, usable, and understandable. These principles are guiding, these principles guided us to make a PWA for everyone. And I think they can help you too. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sam. I'm Snugug on Twitter, and I'm going to be tweeting out some additional links uh, after I'm done. Thank you all so much. Now, uh, stop sharing. That's it. Uh, I now have time for questions if people want to ask me questions, and I'm going to swap to my other camera. Yes. Boris, um, we always take a little bit of time with a hand over here, but I'm back. <laughs> well, awesome talk. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I'm really impressed. I mean, not often do we get a chance to completely redesign a system or, or a complex website and look at all the different aspects. So that is some really cool findings that you presented there. Um, but let's look at Q&A. I know you've reserved quite a bit of time for Q and A, so we only have two questions so far. But if anything, else, anybody else has more questions now, please post them now. But I'll start from top. The first question is: um, What are the best tools for building PWAs? So uh, the great thing about PWAs is that you don't need specific tools to build them. Uh, there are only two things you need to turn your current website or web app into a progressive web app. The first is you need a, man a web app manifest, which is a JSON file that kind of describes your application, uh, your name, your icons, what, how you want it to display when installed. The second thing you need is a service worker, which is a web standard. There is no a uh, specific framework for writing a service worker uh, that has a fetch listener and can respond when offline with a, a 200 request to whatever the start URL in your manifest file is. So part of your manifest file, you say what website or what page you wanna open up when your app starts. That's all you need to create a PWA. No tools, no frameworks, that's all you need. Um, that being said, service workers have a lot of weird edge casey type things. So I highly, highly recommend using Workbox to help you write your service worker. Uh, Workbox is an open source tool uh, written by some Googlers. It's been around for a couple years now. Um, and I'd recommend taking a look at that. And if you use something like create, Re uh, create React app, if you're building React apps, or uh, many of the, the tools that kind of build progressive web apps for you, under the hood, they wind up actually using Workbox to give you your service worker. So I take a look at uh, Workbox. Thanks. That's a great tip. I have not looked at Workbox myself. I'll put it on my list. All right. <clears throat> One more question. As a mobile app developer, I have often been told to shift my focus to PWAs as it would replace the mobile apps in the future. Do you foresee this becoming a reality? It seems like a question from my life. So. <laughs> Please tell uh, us. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to speculate on whether PWAs will replace native apps, but I will tell you some cool things that are happen happening in the PWA world. Um, that makes it, in my opinion, really compelling to build progressive web apps. Uh, so there is, I actually gave a talk on this last year um, at Chrome Dev Summit. The talk is called Bridging the Native App Gap. But there's a whole 
set of new APIs that are being developed for the web to give your web apps more native-like powers. For instance, if your PWA is installed, you can have a badging icon on your app, like if you get a notification, or you can have access to the native file system. So uh, being able to open and load files as if you are an installed app, or getting access to locally installed fonts to build creative apps that you don't need to load all your fonts in over the web. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of API is being worked on right now to make PWAs more and more and more powerful. Uh, and you're able to do more and more things with web apps that you previously thought you can only do with a native app. Um, so those are coming. Some of them have already launched uh, file system access, like I just mentioned, either just launched or is launching within the next version of Chrome or so. In addition to that, PWAs, I feel, are a great platform for building applications, not only because of that investment, but because you truly have a single code base that works on Windows, on Mac, on Linux, on Chrome OS, on iOS, on Android, a single code base that works everywhere. It's truly a universal platform. Now, there is some progressive enhancement you need to do for different features across those platforms but you don't need to build separate binaries and have separate development machines sometimes to build for all those platforms. Um, and then finally, uh, there is a way, at least in the Android world, to take your progressive web app and bundle it into a wrapper that you can then put in the Play Store and promote. This is called uh, Trusted Web Activities. It's a type of th uh, activity that you can create with your Android apps. Um, and you literally take your progressive web app and can use it to put it into the Play Store. Uh, there is an open source tool called Bubble Wrap uh, that you can use to help you take your PWA and build it into a TWA or PWA builder, I believe can do this as well and help you with that as well. PWA Builder is actually okay. a good answer for the first question as well. It's not a tool. It's not a framework. It's a website that can help you generate a basic service worker and your manifest file. Awesome. Um, we just had one more question coming in. Um, I'm not sure what you can make of this. Um, yeah. When a website is displayed in a specific language, how do you ensure that that language grammar rules and things are adhered to, if that makes sense? Yeah. So um, I have seen, so for us, the way that we did it was we had humans translate it. <laughs> and when humans translate it, humans can make sure that they adhere to the right rules. Um, if you're going to use some sort of automated translation like the Google Translate APIs, um, I highly recommend adding a little tag or a blurb or something for your users that says machine translated so that your users know that this was not looked at by a human and grammar might be bad um, or the, the wrong words might be used. Uh, but really kind of the answer is you need to have a human look at it. That's one of the reasons internationalization or rather localization is so hard is um, uh, not only do you need to get the words right, but you need to get the grammar and the the localization right so like even with english uh english in the us english in the uk english in south africa they're all they all have different uh cultural pieces so like you could say one word in and it's english and all three countries know what the physical word is but it could be used differently across those countries um which is why localization is not is not only just language, but region as well. Um, for our content, because it's technical content, we don't have the region needs as much, but you might have those regional needs. It certainly is a big topic in South Africa. We have 11 official languages. English is just one of them. So yeah. things get complex fairly quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I see no other questions coming in, but uh, you can have a look at the chat later and see if um, people have commented on your talk, I'm sure. 
Um, I enjoyed it very much. So thank you so much for getting up early just to be with us here today. You're welcome. And <laughs> I think we have quite a, a break now to refresh a little bit before we go <laughs> into our Beyond talk. So we'll be back at three o'clock. Thanks, everyone.